talk after Paul, though. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty, uh, pretty inspired by those stories. Um, you know, I uh, started to think about my restart story, and uh, I realized that, you know, I come from a, a long line of restart stories, and, uh, you know, the ultimate restart story is one where you, you come from a different country and you leave everything behind and uh, you, you start a new life somewhere that you've never seen or never heard of, or maybe only heard of. Um, you know, in my family, I'll show you the, this is our, our first restart story. Um, that's my grandmother in the center, uh, 1917, my great grandfather on the left hand side uh, in their diner in Rhode Island. And they came over from Greece uh, literally with nothing and started businesses and started restaurants. And so this is the, the first restart story in my family. Uh, and then the second restart story is my father's restart story and, and grandfather's as well. So my grandfather owned a bar uh, in Rhode Island and this is him uh, on the right here and uh, my father in the center who's also in the audience here uh, today. And so this photo was actually taken um, probably on the most influential moment of my dad's life. So he was uh, on his way to law school, had just graduated from uh, Boston University, and uh, was, was starting his career, uh, hopefully, as a, as a lawyer. He was back home helping his dad out at the bar. And uh, that night, um, you know, this is, how, this is the story he tells, so we'll... <laughs> um, he was... He was flirting with some girls at the bar, um, and uh, you know, their, uh, their boyfriends were not too happy about that, and later on that evening, they came back and burned the restaurant down. Um, so that is him with the police officer. Um, this is a photo that we recently uncovered, and I, had, I hadn't seen it until uh, this year, actually. So um, pretty powerful moment, and where he, his restart story uh, really happened. So. You know, that kind of leads to, um, to my restart story. My dad took over that restaurant and then built it into a 400-seat steakhouse and a very successful restaurant for 20 years. Um, and then, really, the second restart story in our family is when we came uh, to Atlanta. And so, in 1997, um, those restaurants um, in, in Rhode Island started going sideways. And so, um, he decided to move our family down to Atlanta, um, sold everything they had, um, and put us in a Volvo station wagon with a dog and a cat and three kids and drove down south. So that's how we came to Atlanta. So um, the next slide here is uh, some embarrassing photos of some early times in, uh, in Atlanta. So our first restaurant in Atlanta was actually uh, the Roasted Garlic. My dad and I were the only two kitchen employees when we opened uh, back in 1998. Uh, we would cook all the food, serve it that night, clean down the kitchen, um, do the dishes, and then uh, be done. And so uh, that, was, that was my first um, really foray into the restaurant business and uh, built that business up uh, to about five locations. And you know, we, we, had some, um, we had some challenges with that because we had individual owner operators of each one. And so uh, they didn't really have the same passion and the focus on quality and service that we did. And so ultimately those restaurants started going out of business as well, which leads us to Sugo, uh, where you know, really my restart story happens. Um, we started that restaurant in 2003. As you can see, um, my dad and I looking uh, quite dapper there. Um, <laughs> And uh, so in those, those early days, it was the, the whole family, we, we built the restaurant. I went off to college, um, went to Cornell, my sister and brother stayed. Uh, they helped build that first restaurant. While I was in school, I started developing some uh, franchise materials because I felt like the, the, the issue with our previous restaurant is that we didn't have uh, structure in place to really grow and build it the right way. Um, so I sold three franchises and, and got them up and running while I was actually in college coming back and forth. And then in 2007, you know, we started seeing the kind of the cracks in, in that as well. And so those restaurants started uh, kind of failing one by one. And so 2007, we were, uh, we were in a tough spot. So I, um, I graduated from Cornell. I remember I, I sold my car and uh, used the, the money that I had left to pay off the bar star so that I could get a diploma and uh, came back down south and, and started literally the, the next day and took over one of our um, 
restaurants that had gone out of business. So that's the one on the bottom left, which is uh, the Sugo location in, in Johns Creek. And so during that time, we had uh, two restaurants and a franchisee, and, and the franchisee had stopped paying us. So uh, we were really two restaurants, one of which was breaking even, and the other one was losing money. The one that I took over um, was particularly painful. I, I, I took it over. We unfortunately had no ability to pay uh, very many employees, so I ran the kitchen and the front of house dining room uh, and had three servers. Uh, two, of, two of the servers are up there. Um, you know, uh, the guy on the right, uh, Martino, and uh, his wife actually is not pictured, uh, are two of the people that really helped me turn that around because uh, at the time we were, we were really struggling and, uh, you know, we, were, we, we weren't able to cover our bills, so we were really uh, bouncing a lot of checks. And I remember the first uh, day that I kind of uh, looked at what was going on and we had spent over $30,000 in overdraft fees uh, that year alone which is just the money that the bank charges you to bounce your checks. So uh, that's not a good sign. Uh, and so I was doing everything I could to kind of get the business afloat. And, you know, I was uh, ra racking up bills with the Department of Revenue and, you know, the IRS and the people who aren't going to knock on your door tomorrow, but they'll be there in six months or a year. And it's going to be really painful when they do get there. And so, you know, at that time, my goal was really just to, um, get the business afloat. And so um, Martino and Ivana and some of those people, you know, were servers and, and they really helped me save that business. In fact, they financed uh, the business in ways where, you know, when I couldn't afford to pay them, they, they would wait a couple weeks or they would take partial payments. And, um, you know, in an environment like today, I can't imagine a server ever doing that. Um, so I'm incredibly thankful uh, to them and everyone that has helped us turn that business around. But it was in those early days that the philosophy of how we run the business today was really formed because, you know, when you only have a handful of guests coming in your dining room and um, at, in those days um, our, you know, kind of sales on an average week were less than, less than 10 grand. So for those of you that know the restaurant business, that's a really low number and one that is very difficult to survive on. And so we we really took um, a lot of attention to detail to each individual guest that was walking through the door. So, you know, there were nights I remember we would have six people walk through the door and, you know, four of them were friends of mine because I called them in because I was afraid we were going to roll a zero. And there's nothing more demoralizing than opening a restaurant and uh, having zero people come in. And so I remember in those days, you know, we would, we would focus on each individual guest and, and make sure they had this excellent dining experience. And I knew that, you know, if I kept doing that over and over again, that kind of the flywheel would build and that it, it would continue to grow momentum. And so that's, you know, the, the mission statement of our company is passionately pursuing the perfect dining experience one guest at a time. And it really is about that individual guest. Um, and as we've grown, and it becomes more and more challenging. But that's the goal that we have for all of our managers and all of our people. Is to, is to focus on the individual and focus on the, the person that's in your seat that's, that's paying to be there and, and give them a, as much of a special experience as we possibly can. Um, and so that started working. And so when we started seeing the growth and you know, was ultimately able to get the, that business to break even and we were making a little bit of money, uh, that's when I, I kind of took a moment and said, what's next? So on the backside of a shopping center in Johns Creek, uh, I, I didn't feel like we were going to get to where we needed to go quickly. Ironically now, over 10 years later, it's one of our most successful businesses and it's because that same philosophy has been applied over long periods of time. Um, but 2009, I decided that I was going to um, take a chance and so this is, uh, this is Iberian Pig in downtown Decatur. So in 2009, I uh, called up a buddy of mine and I, uh, that I went to college with and I said, hey, um, you want to come open this restaurant? I have an idea uh, for a new restaurant and um, are, you, are you interested? And he had uh, never been a chef before and I was like, you know, and, and you can be the chef because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really as good at that. Um, so I, I was hoping that uh, you'd kind of figure it out. So um, <laughs> he said yes and, you know, drove across the country and um, kudos to him for, for doing that. Uh, and so. I remember walking uh, up to the restaurant the, the very first time I took a look at it. I had set up a meeting with the, the landlord and uh, 
Louis Pachulik, who uh, has recently passed away, actually this year, uh, and, and give him a ton of credit for taking a chance on me. I was dressed in an uh, oversized Joseph A. Banks suit on the Decatur Square, <laughs> and uh, at, at 24 years old, I can imagine I stuck out pretty, uh, pretty poorly. Uh, but he, you know, he said, in hindsight, he said, if I had known how old you are, I'd never would have rented the space to you. But you know, you looked good in that suit, so hey, you know, um, there you go. But anyway, so I, I immediately felt a uh, connection and uh, felt great about the space and the bones and, and the Decatur Square. Now, to give you some context, and the Decatur Square at the time was not what it is today. You know, most of, on the south side of the square, most of the businesses were either out of business or were kind of like bodega corner store. There was a spot where you could get your venereal disease checked. I mean, it was not a... Uh, um, what it is today that, that when you go on the Decatur Square. And so we had no parking, no street visibility. So everyone I talked to said, this is a terrible idea. So, and it was 2009 at the bottom of the recession. So there's that on top of it. So people weren't doing well at that time. And so, but I felt really good about it. We went in with um, 100,000. <laughs> Very rational. Uh, I, I felt really good about it, though. There, there was something about the space that, that really spoke to me. And uh, I knew that if we applied some of that, those same concepts that we had done out in the burbs, that it would work and do it with kind of like a new, fresh cuisine and something different. And um, so we had $100,000 that we had squirreled away from uh, those other businesses and kind of turning them around. And I hired a general contractor, and that general contractor uh, took the $20,000 deposit and skipped town. Um, after, after doing some of the demo work in the restaurant, so um, the, uh, the, uh, the restaurant was mostly demolished at that point, and so I had to figure out how to open a restaurant with $80,000. Um, you know, to give you uh, additional context, that's still, even then, a very small amount of money to open a restaurant. And so I decided that the only way it would work is if I became the general contractor so, and hired a sub. <laughs> Again, never been a general contractor before and had no idea what I was doing. But I found a shady general contractor that was willing to give me a signature for a thousand bucks and uh, pull the permit for me. And then, then we got started. But um, <laughs> that being said, that, you know, um, at the time, that didn't mean we were actually doing work with the permit. Like, we were doing the work anyway. Like, and then the permit was just kind of like for show. So we found, um, we found some people that were willing to work um, on barter and uh, creative kind of like financing. And so I was able to you know, find an electrician, find a plumber, find a woodworker. Uh, our painter we hired literally off of Marta. She was, uh, she was begging. And we, we were, so is there anything you can do? do you, can you work? Uh, she's like, I can paint. I was like, you're hired. So <laughs> we, we, uh, we you know, bought her paint and she kept going, paid her Marta every day. And uh, so she painted the restaurant. And so we opened the restaurant uh, September 25th, 2009. It was only, uh, we signed the lease in July. So do the math. That's a really uh, quick turnaround. So I'm still like the fastest general contractor in the city of Atlanta. <laughs> and so we opened that restaurant. It was a Friday night. Uh, you know, you usually don't open restaurants on a Friday night. It's a very bad idea. But we didn't think anyone would show up because we didn't, you know, we weren't talking about it or doing anything. Uh, and so 200 people showed up that opening night and we got absolutely destroyed. Like, I don't think anyone got anything they actually ordered. But <laughs> they, they definitely got food. They got something. Um, and we were really nice to them. We were really, really nice to them. So, and that's how we got started. And, you know, we had to open on Friday night because I, we had literally spent every dime that we had, overdrawn all the accounts, and had about $20,000 in inventory unpaid for, most of which was alcohol, which is actually illegal in the state of Georgia. Um, <laughs> don't get me started on the, the alcohol laws in the state. Uh, but we had to do it. And then the next morning, we woke up uh, early and took the cash we'd made that night. And uh, we went out and bought all the pots and pans and spatulas and things that we needed to actually cook the food because <laughs> We didn't have any of that because that was all left over from the old restaurant and like most of it was unusable. And so um, the cooks literally ha didn't even have the utensils that they needed to get it done. So uh, that Saturday was a little bit better than Friday. But uh, you know, we, 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 we applied that same kind of idea of just every day getting better. Um, and so that's kind of what has, has launched the company. And so um, these are kind of all of our brands. I'll, I'll talk quickly 
through um, kind of some of the thought processes and my restart story. And every uh, business that we do is, is a creative endeavor. And so um, you come with a, a set of kind of ideas and then you test those ideas in the marketplace. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And, um, when, and, and neither of those things are, are easy because when they work, you just, you're holding on for dear, dear life and you're trying to make sure that you're making people happy that are coming in the door because there's so many of them. And then the other side, when it doesn't work, that's like, well, there's not a lot of people coming through the door. So that's really, really hard too. Um, and so how do, we, how do we get more people in and make them happy? Um, so I talked through kind of these uh, two brands and then um, Double Zero was our, our, our third brand. And so uh, that was another kind of like uh, moment where, you know, the, the, the theme of this talk is rest then restart. And we weren't really doing a lot of the resting part of that. So we kind of jumped right into Double Zero right after we had opened Iberian Pig because things are going so well there. It was like, oh, I can do anything right. And so um, <laughs> let's just sign a lease for a 10,000 square foot space in Sandy Springs. And so um, that was even just as difficult. And so I got into that space and tried the same playbook. I actually hired a general contractor this time. Um, but even so, it, was, it went incredibly over budget and it was extremely difficult getting it open and then we did get it open and we got hit hard um, and then not at all and we had to figure out how to like really kind of restart the business and, and again, um, we, we, we were back in kind of a, the same scenario we were back when I kind of first took over. We were, we were struggling and, and um, working really hard and, uh, it didn't seem like we were making as much progress, even though we had cr created all this stuff. And so that was where kind of the, the rest part comes in, and maybe, maybe not so much rest, but focus. And we, we stopped what we were doing for a little while, and we just focused on making everything that we were doing better and focus on kind of those, those values and the mission statement. And so, um, and that worked really well. And then in, in 2014, we opened Cooks and Soldiers. And so after three years of kind of taking a break from really uh, a creative endeavor, we opened this restaurant. And this came from a trip that I had taken to um, southern France and uh, northern Spain and, and discovered this uh, border region cuisine, uh, the Basque country, that was super fascinating. And I, I thought at the time that we were just going to get a couple ideas for Iberian Pig. but. Really, I came back and I was like, we have to do a whole restaurant just on this. Uh, and then my brother, uh, who's also in the audience, he went to Spain uh, and worked at a three Michelin star restaurant, Arzac, for uh, almost a year and kind of helped learn the cuisine and then came back and we opened this restaurant together. Uh, and that was really kind of our first, um, I would say, critical success. You know, everything we had done up until that point was really about, you know, the guest and, and not the critics. And I think that that's something that we continue to strive to do today is, is be restaurants for people, not food writers. But this one they particularly liked, and so we got some really nice accolades, uh, a James Beard nomination, and uh, Eater Restaurant of the Year, um, Atlanta Magazine put us in like their top 50 restaurants every year since. So that was a, a really uh, a, a big win for us. So that was, a, that was very exciting. And then um, Bar Mercado, um, and I'll skip ahead to Recess as well. Um, these two concepts are in Crock Street Market, and so um, Recess is our food stall there, so it's a fast casual restaurant that serves food that you can feel good about and keeps your energy level high and uh, doesn't s slow you down throughout the day. So this is the food that I like to eat most. And then Bar Mercado, which is our um, casual Spanish tapas restaurant, uh, also in Crog Street Market. And so I'll say, you know, uh, to wrap things up, what I've kind of learned through the process and, and my restart story and kind of coming from uh, a series of of restart stories, you know, my, my big takeaways are throughout um, everything that we've done, I think that if you pull it down to like its most core, it, everything is really about individual relationships and taking things down to that micro level um, where it's, a, it's an individual person uh, that you're trying to make a connection with or make happy in your business or whether you're a, a, a creative and you're, um, and you're focusing on, you know, who is that person on the other side of, of this, of whatever I'm creating, um, and thinking about it from that perspective. That has, ha that has um, been um, a big part of kind of my career and, and what I've done, and um, it really is, is, is the essence of our company. And then I think the other piece for me is really about um, 
ultimately integrity and, and when you say you're going to do something, follow through on it. And so throughout the years, even when we, when we had struggles, um, you know, I was always transparent with people about whether or not we would be able to follow through with doing something, whether it's that server that we owed money to or, um, you know, whoever along the way, it was about this is, this is where we're at, you know, and, and this is the brutal facts of reality right now. Uh, and I'm going to do everything I can to follow through on what I say I'm going to do. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that people respond well to that. So thank you.